Russell, it's Lucy Longhurst here with a special look at what happened in the interactive world in 1996. Multimedia got active, the web went wacky, games found new friends, and we all stopped believing our eyes. A whole year in half an hour, it's got to be Cybernet. With great developer support and some very clever marketing, 96 was definitely the PlayStation's year. Unlike the Saturn, whose good titles remained scarce, Sony's console delivered a wealth of high-quality titles, both originals and conversions from other formats. Games strayed a little from the pure action arcade style that first appeared for the console, but the faster they went, the better they tended to sell. A bandicoot is an Australian marsupial, and this one was determined to jump and spin his way through over 30 levels of gameplay. Of the handful of good platformers available, Crash Bandicoot was the prettiest and most playable, using the kind of cartoon style Sega is usually known for. The more levels you explored, the more varied the action became, accompanied by some great characters, like Ripperoo here, who's dodging an explosive end, and also this guy, Papu Papu, who you really didn't want to get on the wrong side of. Crash is bound to be back for more adventures and he could still become a PlayStation icon. Wipeout was one of the first titles for the PlayStation, yet its sequel, Wipeout 2097, was still a surprise. It was even faster and more colourful than the first, but this time greater attention had been paid to the handling of the ships. It meant most of us could finally fly these super sleek craft without spending weeks on the training mode. Again, a whole album's worth of soundtrack was supplied by some of the world's top dance acts. Fans of Four Wheels might have been prone to motion sickness, but rushing into the unknown was definitely a sensation to be sampled. Less speed and far more thought was needed with Buster Move 2, a very cute puzzle strategy title that confounded players who thought fun had to be 3D. Simple graphics aside, this was annoyingly addictive stuff. You launched coloured balloons into those hanging above, got three or more together so they burst, taking any others underneath with them. If you burst them all, you won the round. Buster Move 2 stood out as old-fashioned compared with the rest of the 32-bit game crowd, but if you ever get a chance to play, you could be there for hours. Ninety-six was the year of the Olympics, and sport titles were everywhere. Some were fairly poor, but one had the competitive edge. International Track and Field was a collection of 11 Olympic events that was great fun played alone, but it really came into its own when played against friends. Choosing any event, you had to make a minimum score in each one. However, you did get a second go at everything, and your best score was the one that counted. The weirdest thing about track and field was that you had to hit the game controls so fast and so often, it really did bring you out in a sweat. Brilliant! Excellent! You are the winner! Tekken 2 could well be the combat game to beat them all, so what made this sequel so special? Well, there were loads of new features to keep you happy, including a training mode, where you could practice your moves against a character who wouldn't fight back, unlike this guy. Discovering all of the game's moves was one tough task as there were over 500 to learn, but that was the point. A combat game that was simple to pick up and almost impossible to master. It kept fans and newcomers to the series coming back for more. You win! You win. We often get a bit serious about surfing the waves of the World Wide Web, so we thought we'd show you some of our favourite sites of 96, from the most hair-raising to the downright silly. Roller coasters have always been the ultimate thrill ride, hurtling through the open air 100 feet in the sky, the wind in your hair and your stomach somewhere else. This was an experience which you just couldn't get in front of your PC or games console, no matter how great the game. The internet is full of facts, figures and the occasional movie about these round-the-twist rides, but if you can't handle a G-Force, how about the next best thing? We found a virtual roller coaster where you could design your own bumps and jumps from the comfort of your modem. If that was all a bit much, you may have needed some superpowers, and hanging out in cyberspace, we tracked down Linda Carter, the star-spangled 70s superstar Wonder Woman.
website was a shrine to the Amazonian heroine and it contained heaps of pictures. Like many sites on the net, this wasn't official, but it was run by her self-proclaimed number one fan, who was bursting to share his passion with the virtual world. This final website was one of the most unbelievable we found over the year. These paintings may look like postmodernist abstract masterpieces, but no, the artists in question were cats, or so the site owners would have had us believe. I still reckon some of those paintings will look nice on my bedroom wall, but if you weren't convinced, then this film of the artist at work may make you pause for thought. Till next time, happy surfing! Learning on a PC has never been so easy. In 1996, we no longer had to rely on encyclopedic titles like Encarta to find out about life and the universe. Although Encarta is great for looking up information, it's not particularly interactive, and even subject-specific titles such as the Encyclopedia of Space and the Universe proved a bit heavy going for the younger audience. This title, however, did offer the avid learner the chance to launch off on a tour of the galaxy in a space console that they controlled. The only unanswered question was whether there really are aliens on other planets. From intergalactic travel to underground excavation, it's Dinosaur Hunter, another edutainment title which concentrated on one subject. 3D dinosaurs sprang to life and roamed a museum once you discovered all of its missing pieces. During your historical adventure, you'd found lots of information and puzzles that Bavaria, helped you learn. Germany. The next step on in interactive learning in 96 was the play-along book. If you want to read and play in the story, click over there now! In the fantastic world of the Toy Story animated storybook, you had to help Buzz and Woody become friends. There were lots of fun things to do to keep you amused for hours, and you unwittingly found yourself learning at the same time. This was one of the best storybooks of the year, so as you can see, Buzz is doing a little celebrating. Buzz, we don't have time for that now! Oh. to move on, my friend. To find out more about the Animal Kingdom, it was worth trying Mortimer and the Riddle of the Medallion. You chose to be either Sid or Sally, and had to prove you knew enough about animals to find the seven pieces of the missing medallion. All the animals you saw as you ventured through the land had been physiologically inanimatized. That's turned to stone to you and me. You had to bring them back to life. Along the way, you picked up snippets of information that helped you complete each level. But it felt so much like a game, it never felt like you were being taught. As edutainment advances at such a rate, we're wondering how much further it can actually go. A year is a long time in the interactive industry, and in 96, several factors made games change quite a bit. PC owners got a boost as titles moved away from horrible DOS-based software to Windows 95, which claimed to make running them child's play. The old Windows just couldn't compete with a new version that displayed the kind of speed and realism usually associated with 32-bit consoles. It was all down to a special part of Windows 95 called DirectX, which finally gave programmers a simpler way to make their ideas come to life. Unfortunately, these powerful tools demanded more powerful PCs, so some people's systems were left unable to cope. Going in the other direction were old games, repackaged and sometimes redesigned for a generation that remembered them from the days when they were on the cutting edge of technology. Two-dimensional squeaky sound effects and not much variety. Arcade titles from the early 80s were claimed to be purer and more addictive than today's super slick experiences. Not everyone agreed, but they certainly showed younger players where the ideas that helped form the games business came from. Whether we'll be looking back at the games made in the 90s with such fondness in the 21st century is another matter. Playing against other people has always been more interesting than playing against computers, and the internet became the driving force for multiplayer games in 96. 
whether it was becoming someone else in a virtual world or logging on to forums to compete against strangers in another country, the net made sitting in front of a computer more social than it had been. Multiplayer network options in games became the hot extra. Few people had more than one computer at home, but if they had a modem, they could reach thousands with just a phone call. Online services grew and grew, and the future for the technology looked bright indeed. Another way to keep players at the same game is the inclusion of secret features and cheat codes. Keen gamers with programming know-how used to hack into the game code to give themselves an edge. This year in particular saw more and more titles with options deliberately hidden in their design that were only revealed months after release. This was one trend where clever marketing by software publishers actually made game fans happy, partly by challenging them to find the secrets themselves and also by allowing those who weren't quite such natural players to savour those later levels. Coming up, PC graphics reach the next level and we talk to the people spinning digital magic at the movies. The Saturn is still seen as the poor relation of the PlayStation within the 32-bit market. Somehow, Sega can't recapture the days of Mega Drive glory. The PlayStation churns out software of a better quality with games people want to play. That said, there have been quite a few gems for the Saturn during 1996, so here are four of our favourites. Flying onto the console came the long-awaited Knights, and it certainly lived up to the hype with its enchanting world's unique graphical style and fast, smooth gameplay. Knights is set in a dreamscape where, as one of two characters, you can fly and perform amazing acrobatics in your quest to restore peace to the land of Nightopia. The different worlds you visit on your quest are colourful and visually quite stunning. However, Knights didn't sell as well as Sega had hoped. Did the game prove too difficult to play with too many complexities putting off the majority of game players? Whatever the reason, Sega's hopes for a blockbuster showcase title for the Saturn faded with its sales. The Saturn sequel of the year prize went to Panzer Dragoon 2. This time round, there was just the one dragon who couldn't even fly to begin with. Once in the skies, the more mature and airworthy dragon could look up, down and all around, which was just as well as the enemy was everywhere. Skilled players could also discover lots of extra weapons and tricks, but these were for more experienced Dragooners only. Panzer Dragoon 2 remains a challenging game, and it's certainly become a classic title for the console, adding an extra twist to the Gothic Air combat series. Sports-wise, we reckon that Worldwide Soccer 97 was one of the more impressive sims of the Saturn year. Among the plethora of footy games, this one stood out for the very realistic motion-captured moves of the players, the classy trick shots, and of course, that all-important gameplay. Worldwide Soccer was easy to pick up and play, and it wasn't too fast, unlike some other soccer sims. Every aspect of this game seemed to work, from the various stadiums and variety of game surroundings, to decisions from the ref, the commentary, and well-chosen camera angles. It was refreshing to pick up and play a soccer game that we really did get into. A real winner. Sega's hottest arcade series has always been Virtua Fighter, and converting it to the Saturn has helped keep the console afloat. Virtua Fighter 2 was seen as a great improvement on the original game, with quicker reactions and even a few improvements on the arcade version. The fighters were all nicely detailed using the Saturn's highest resolution graphics mode, sacrificing only the background realism to keep up the frame rate. It was a game which drew many first-time buyers to the Saturn when it was released. However, the number of games that were able to display this kind of technical achievement in the same year could be counted on one hand, making Sega's success in the home still unsure. Ora, ora, ora!
there were some exciting developments in computer game hardware during 1996. Amongst them were various 3D graphics cards which helped draw fast, smooth and realistic visuals for PCs. But there was one system that really stood out for us and that was PowerVR. PowerVR steered clear of traditional polygon models and expensive, large memory systems used by other graphics cards. Instead, it had its own secret rendering system. The results were visuals that included true shadows, atmospheric fogging and multiple light sources. Its technical excellence was also recognised by leading PC manufacturer Compaq, who signed a deal to put PowerVR into several of their most popular models as standard. PowerVR claimed to be the fastest 3D approach available in 96, but other PC graphics card makers were already lining up their contenders for what would be a tough battle. It was a quiet year for Nintendo software releases, but things did gain pace in their hardware market. Firstly, with the Game Boy Pocket. The Game Boy is still one of the company's biggest successes, despite the lack of colour or advanced graphics, probably because of the games themselves. The latest Game Boy development was the pocket version, and it still wasn't in colour. The new model was smaller and thinner, so it fitted in your pocket, hence the name. Nintendo also claimed that the screen was much clearer, with better defined characters using black against grey, not that mushy yellow you always had to squint at. And the other good news was that it only needed two batteries. This classy metallic pocket machine brought the Game Boy right up to date and gave it a whole new lease of life. And of course, you can't talk about 1996 hardware without mentioning the Nintendo 64. Famous as much for release delays as its superb visual realism, the new 64-bit machine was finally released, firstly in Japan, then later in the United States. Poor old Europe was left lagging behind with a promise to sample the high-powered technology only after an April 1997 launch. The initial games for the console lived up to expectations, but Nintendo were clearly going for quality, not quantity, with only three titles on offer. There was much speculation about whether Nintendo could sustain its sales with so little software. And indeed, after a huge run in Japan, N64 sales did slow down considerably. But one thing most people agreed on was that the machine's flagship title, Super Mario 64, was one of the best computer games ever created. And looking like this, who were we to disagree? Back in the days when 16-bit machines ruled the world, the main contenders for the throne were an overweight plumber called Mario, an anarchic worm with attitude called Jim, and Sonic, the little blue hedgehog with a fiery temper. With the advent of 32-bit machines, though, 1996 was full of new quirky characters trying to jump and spin their way to stardom. Crash Bandicoot was an Antipodean adventurer who was ready to stomp on all comers to be crowned the PlayStation's platform king, even if there wasn't anything too revolutionary in the gameplay. This was very much your traditional platform game, just very pretty and very playable. Hitting the top notes on the PC was one character who was definitely a meaty contender, Animal. The game began as things went horribly wrong in Snackopolis, and it was up to our hero to shred the criminal vegetables who'd taken over. Animal certainly looked as if he gave as good as he got, but the game came with a warning. Some parts of it were hard to digest. On the robotic front, there was a certain rabbit back for a second outing on the PlayStation in Jumping Flash 2. Jumping Flash was one of the first 3D platformers, and although you didn't see much more of him in the sequel, Robin was certainly a star in the making. Hey, Got him! Naughty, naughty, naughty little space bunny! Hey, qua yungo zore kore that's the magic spell that caused complete pandemonium on the PlayStation. Its two stars set new standards in character design, and now they're leading the pack for the next generation of high-res heroes. Whether they'll prove to be as popular as Mario and friends, we'll just have to wait and see. Realistic computer visual effects have been with us since the 80s, but even though the results have become more advanced, professionals will usually pay big bucks for the latest version of just one program, Alias Wavefront. Costing more than your average car, and that's not including the silicon graphics computers you need to run it on, Alias Wavefront's biggest user in 96 was the movie business. 
Sometimes it's obvious when a computer's behind something, but more often than not, you won't realise they've been used, and they can often save the day. The Crimson Tide director, Tony Scott, wanted a realistic-looking battle sequence, but he didn't have any handy submarines, and filming in real water creates its own set of problems. When you're underwater, it's very difficult to see even a third of the length down a, a, an Alabama or a Trident-type submarine. So in order to show the sequence, Tony decided to use the torpedoes as kind of like the arrow between the two opposing groups. And so when we first approached the, the, the problem, we began using traditional underwater wet-wet techniques where we had a third-scale torpedo. But very quickly, you know, you realize that you can't make a torpedo do a turn or you don't have a tank big enough to show the scene. So that's when digital technology or CGI torpedoes were, were put into the, to the mode. Another big budget movie that used alias Wavefront to the max was Batman Returns. Big cities traditionally mean big models, but visual effects man John Dykstra decided to go virtual. Gotham City. The idea of creating a model that would be large enough to allow us to get the scope uh, of the shot that actually ended up in the film was impractical. The obvious solution to this was to create a CGI city. But how do you have a stuntman jump down the side of a virtual building? Well, the answer is you don't. You make him with a computer too. The toughest thing that we did on the movie was probably the fall completely computer-generated image. We used wavefront material to do the animatic for it, alias to do the modeling and rendering of the image of the building which went in the background. Computer designs are getting everywhere, especially in schools and universities. A different part of the same software that made you believe a bat could fly is now helping students make their own dream cars. One thing that the software and the tools that we use in the digital realm enable us to do is explore broader applications of design or experiment more broadly with design in newer ways that the traditional tools will not allow us to do. Whether it's a pop video you have to finish faster than you'd like, the open with another look at the interactive highlights of 1996. Theme parks that made the movies real, games that broke the mold, and CD-ROMs that let your creativity grow and grow. If it wasn't worth seeing, it wasn't on Cybernet. It took longer than expected, but PCs, despite their high price, became a powerful game platform in 96. Processors, graphics, sound, it all became faster, more powerful, and easier to get going with Windows 95. Increasingly, PC owners, used to thoughtful strategy games, wanted to feel the wind in their hair. If you wanted a racing game and you wanted it real, then you didn't have to look any further than Grand Prix 2. Delayed and delayed until it was finally ready to release to an expectant audience, this one didn't disappoint. You could hit the quick start and have fun, or use the car settings option to alter everything from the suspension to the rear aerofoil trim. It was a simulation and it was exciting. You could choose the style and difficulty to suit your driving skills. It showed an industry tired of ever-increasing development periods that something could still be a huge success despite years of broken promises. The only promise made for worms was that tiny heroes could pack a surprisingly heavy punch. With the aid of only a few pink pixels, squeaky voices and a huge number of weapons, from bazookas to exploding sheep, worms became a classic. 3D polygons were nowhere to be seen. The only concession to presentation was a simple scrolling landscape. Not that you wanted to look at it, you'd rather blow it up. You had to be careful where you aimed, though, as you were just as likely to be caught in the blast as the opposing army of worms. Worms soon got an add-on disc and slithered its way onto just about every gaming format around. Character design and traditional animation were the key to Tomb Raider's success, an Indiana Jones-type adventure where Lara Croft, British adventurer, was more active than your average action hero. Running, jumping, swimming, Tomb Raider's hand-animated graphics showed just what was possible when you didn't use a motion capture system and allowed a talented artist free reign. Mm -hmm. 
Level design proved equally important. Raider's unique landscape editor was happy to switch between Aztec temples and lost valleys inhabited by prehistoric creatures. Wherever you found yourself, whatever you did, Tomb Raider was a world you kept wanting to explore. A roundup of 1996's best PC games couldn't leave out the most eagerly awaited of them all. Quake, the successor to Doom, was more realistic, more complex, more massive, and basically more of the same. Where Doom and its sequel were fake 3D, this had enough dimensions to induce vertigo. If you were of a nervous nature, this wasn't one to play in the dark. Where it really did differ from the original was you had to have a Pentium-class PC to run it, and that really summed up the year. Upgrade your machine or get left behind. Magic Carpet. Although we're always going on about how similar game genres are and how we long to see something completely fresh and new, there were a few glimmers of hope during 1996. Just to prove that the industry does have some bright new ideas, here are the innovations that caught our eye. It looked so simple it could have come straight out of the Pac-Man era, but gearheads proved to be a revelation. This was a war of wind-up toys where the aim was to be the first one to get 21 gadgets to the other side of the screen. This simple task quickly became one of the fastest and funniest strategy problems around, as each toy tried to stop the other the only way it knew how. Just one look explains why The Neverhood wasn't like any other adventure. Film and TV had both used clay modelling techniques for animated stories, but it took the backing of Steven Spielberg to finally make it interactive. The puzzles weren't nearly as simple as you first thought, but the animation really knocked most other games on the head. Following the success of Dogs, a feline version, Cat, was 96's answer to a totally original screensaver. It was a computerised pet with a personality all of its own. This was one virtual animal you couldn't ignore. It needed to be fed, watered and loved if it was going to grow big and strong. These cats have been purring all over our computer screens since they were born. Slowing things right down was Aquanaut's holiday, so where had all the jumping, fighting and shooting we'd come to expect on PlayStation games gone? Your mission was to build an artificial reef to protect marine life, or drive around the ocean floor communicating with underwater species. This was a game in a league of its own, a perfect way to relax. Speeding things right up again, Tunnel B1 was a racer and shooter, so what was new? Well, we reckon the graphics for this game deserve a special mention. Producing multiple light sources, lens flare, smoke trails and so many other effects, all at an amazing frame rate, meant the PlayStation had never looked so good. So, by the end of 96, there was plenty of proof that innovation in the interactive industry was alive and well, and set to continue. Coming up, world building on the web, and is it a movie, is it a ride? Arnie gets to go 3D. Sixteen bit games are still strutting their stuff despite the dominance of the PlayStation, PC, and Saturn in 1996. 32-bit software may have been faster, flashier and altogether more impressive, but many players still had their trusty Mega Drives and SNESs, and games companies, contrary to rumours, hadn't completely forgotten about them. Mario reared his head again in Yoshi's Island. This time, however, he didn't have such a starring role. That was left to the cutest dinosaur in computerdom, Yoshi. Unlike other platformers, in Yoshi's Island you didn't just jump on everything in your path. Oh no, this was one dinosaur who could eat enemies and turn them into eggs, which he carried behind him. Yoshi's childlike design and colouring was the complete opposite to other graphics produced that year. Gulping down baddies, collecting coins, stars and flowers, it was another huge hit for Nintendo, confirming their golden touch with characters and worlds that gamers all over the world have taken to their hearts. And 
where would 16-bit games be without Sonic the Hedgehog? In 96, Sonic emerged in impressive form in Sonic 3D, showing us just what a 16-bit console really could do. In his exciting new form, Sonic's mission was to rescue Flickies, birds with absolutely no sense of direction, and after guiding them to safety, he could teleport himself to the next stage. There were seas of gold rings for him to collect along the way, and 21 mind-blowing levels to explore. Sonic 3D was one game guaranteed to keep the Mega Drive very much alive and kicking. One of the success stories of 96 was the Disney movie Toy Story. There were loads of spin-off products, but the computer game was no mere afterthought. In fact, Toy Story's impressive animation was really superb for a 16-bit game, and it did justice to the movie's slick style and presentation. The gameplay more than lived up to expectations, with Woody, the film's main character, playing a starring role. It wasn't all basic platform gaming either. There was a micro-machine style racing level, plus various other games that followed the film's plot with more imagination than you would have expected. And speaking of Micro Machines, 1996 saw the latest edition of the popular racing sim for the Mega Drive, Micro Machines Military. Codemasters have consistently resisted the urge to move these tiny cars onto 32-bit consoles, and in this instalment, the vehicles were given firepower to blast their way around the various courses. Having to avoid mines and fire at the opposition added a little more spice to the minuscule racers, and it seemed that the Micro Machines would run for as long as the Mega Drive stayed in the console upgrade race. And finally, one of the most impressive 16-bit titles was also one of the rarest. Super Mario RPG was the first time the Italian plumber had lost his flat appearance. But for reasons known only to its creators, it was never formally released outside Japan. Instead, the game became a hugely popular rental in the United States and was sold in other markets via unofficial import. 96 may have been the last great year for 16-bit consoles, but it illustrated an important point. Give programmers enough time and experience to learn what's possible with a piece of hardware, and they can create wonders. Back in the olden days, when cyberspace was young, the World Wide Web used to look like this. sequences grew from atmospheric starters to fully-fledged mini-movies in 1996. For Tekken 2, motion capture, moody characters and a series of contrasting storylines all intertwined to the accompaniment of one of the best theme soundtracks around. Heavily influenced by Japanese manga tales of corporate greed versus individual struggle, this sophisticated world set the scene in less than a minute for an equally sophisticated combat game. Beginning less seriously, yet hinting at something darker, was the fantastical opening sequence created for Knights. We all have dreams and not all of them are nice. In this game, you choose to be either Elliot or Clarice, each with their own fears. The sense of menace built up as the fairly ordinary bunch of judges in Clarice's nightmare soon turned into something far more scary. Bad dreams weren't allowed to win, though, and the pace and mood swiftly changed as Clarice was welcomed into the game to fight back. Attention, all personnel, emergency, enemy ships approaching. Science fiction and especially alien invasions are a popular starting point for games, whatever their genre. In 96, Criticon was a combat title, but its first few seconds involved aliens in control of a crystal that gave them far too much power power they were willing to use. Thanks to the movie quality animation system alias Wavefront, textures, lighting and smoke effects were far more refined here than in other sequences of this type. Another factor that helped it stand out was the PlayStation's excellent video playback technology that easily surpassed that of the PC and Saturn for resolution and sheer vibrancy.
favourite, though, for 96 was the far too long, far too brilliant and far too irrelevant introduction to X2. If you'd ever needed proof that 3D animators were having more fun than game programmers, this was it. With its huge virtual landscapes, intricate mechanical design and non-stop camera angles, detailing the trip from a hero's home to his trusty spaceship had never been done in such a dramatic way. The only thing left for us to do was to wait for a computer or console that could make the games just as good once they'd finally begun. In a year when special effects emerged as the biggest crowd pleaser at the movies, theme parks took a similar approach by making technology a ride in itself. Universal Studios in Florida is one of the places to go for high-tech roller coaster style experiences. In 1996, buying a ticket for one of these rides, like Back to the Future, was the closest most of us would get to virtual reality. However, the park's newest attraction involved a film that didn't exist in any cinema, characters who came out of the screen to complete the illusion, and some actor named Arnie. Terminator 2 3D was second for second the most expensive film ever made. But it wasn't just film, it was a blend of full-size animatronic robots, Arnie stunt doubles, motorbike stunts and far too much dry ice. It was a chance to see a familiar world in a whole new light. What T2 has, which other 3D attractions don't have, is that first of all we have the original cast and director and crew that worked on T2. So we have really the same Hollywood cast which is terrific because you get to see Arnold Schwarzenegger, you get to see Eddie Furlong and Linda Hamilton, and you also see the T-1000 cop that everybody remembers from T2. Terminator creator James Cameron was no stranger to using new technology to tell his kind of stories, so breaking through that cinema screen felt like the next step. Terminator leaps out of the future. You see a glimpse of the future war, you hear a Harley coming, and uh, here comes Terminator leaping off the screen into the, into the uh, theater. And these are, these are kind of slate of hand, magic uh, type illusions. Illusions that were helped by an idea that became popular in the 80s, 3D glasses. The audience will be jumping back because with the 3D technology, we really feel like he's taking your head off, not just mine. Interactive movies as a genre hadn't really worked for game systems up to this point, but this live-action experience came even closer to putting you inside rather than outside a filmmaker's imagination. This is just another step, another wonderful step that brings you into the filmmaking experience. This is break ground. This is a new venue. It's like every detail of T2 3D is a little bigger and a little better than everything else that, uh, that we've done in the, in the previous films. No! Look out! 1996, more than any year before it, saw audiences searching for edge-of-the-seat thrills. As computer-generated effects became an integral part of the magic, we all fell under its electronic spell. Phew, so much happened in 96, it was tough to get a good night's sleep. You didn't want to miss a thing. We can't be everywhere at once, so get in contact by letter or email and tell us...